Simply Financial with Christopher Calandra, Certified Financial Planner, is an innovative, comprehensive, informative, and cutting-edge podcast that discusses financial topics ranging from personal finance, economics, politics, and personal growth. Simply Financial will cover intriguing and thought-provoking questions so that the listener can simply increase their financial IQ. Thank you for listening today. This is season number three, episode 41 of the Simply Financial podcast. I'm your host, Christopher Calandra. On today's show, I have with me David Lake, who I've known for quite a while now. He is a CPA in Connecticut with offices in Meriden and Madison. Additionally, uh, he teaches accounting at the collegiate level, and he has a business relationship with us here at Elliott Wealth Management Services. He's part of the team because his role as a CPA sometimes calls for financial planning and investment planning, and in those instances, he refers them uh, to us, and we work on things together, and it delivers a higher level of service to his clients. It's a great working relationship. We've also become very good friends the last couple of years, and I'm lucky to have him on the episode today. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Appreciate being here. So what we're going to talk today is business valuations. And last week's show, I talked about uh, the three phases of succession planning. And one of the key elements of that is business valuations. And very often for small businesses, closely held family businesses, uh, they need business valuations done. And often the CPA is in the best position to do that. So you've done that for your clients when it's needed, right? Yeah, over the years, I've done dozens of business valuations for the exact reasons that you're talking about. And they can be tricky, right? Because there's different industries. I know for a financial planning practice, there's certain metrics that are uh, used to help determine a value of a, a business, and there's certain norms that you'd expect in a transaction where a practice is being sold. Um, but if you're dealing with different industries, you need to familiarize yourself when you're working on evaluation with the industry norms, right? Correct. I mean, when you, whenever you look at any individualized business, they all have their own nuances to, to what you're talking about. And because of that, there's three different ways to look at a business valuation. There's asset-based, there's current revenues, and a future revenue model. And what you do is you have an understanding or gain an understanding of the business to understand which one to, quote, weight more within your business valuation. Okay. So as a, if a business is growing, future revenue is more important than uh, current revenue. If you're a manufacturer, the assets of the business are more important than somebody like myself who just owns a couple computers. All right. So typically, um, and let me just say, because I, I think I jumped ahead, you've also shared with me that um, you're a CPA, so you're qualified to do valuations and you have experience doing them for quite a while across multiple different business sizes and industry types. Uh, but you're also pursuing a special designation in regards to this. Um, before we get into my next couple of questions, can you just touch on that? What, it, what is the designation? So th- similar to a CPA or a certified financial planner, there's what's called a certified valuation advisor analyst. And uh, you have to take an exam, so I'm in the process of studying for that, and I'll take the exam a little later this year, but a big part of that process is being a CPA. So this is like having an, an addendum to my CPA oh. at the end of... Because you could get that designation and not be a CPA. Yes, but it's significantly harder. Yeah, because it's a lot heavy on the tax side. Correct. Understood. Correct. Okay, that makes sense. So it's what, CVAA? CVA. CVA. Yep. Okay. Because CVAA doesn't exactly roll right. off the tongue. <laughs> right. All right. So you mentioned um, the preparation. So you so in a normal valuation, and and I've seen this in play. So listeners, I've kind of gone through this with Dave. We had a meeting with um, a, a client of mine that I introduced to to Dave uh, a little bit ago. Um, but you you basically meet with the business owner. Meet with the business owner. You look at what they're doing, how they're doing it. You look at tax returns, financial statements, both current and past, and if they have um, a a budget or a future uh, plan, you look at that because all that comes into play. You mean like a business plan? 
Yeah, or just a budget that goes into the future. I mean, you don't have to have a formalized business plan. Essentially, what we're going to do is somewhat create that through the business valuation. Okay, so is this done, so the in-person meeting with the business owner, or the principals of the business, um, typically you're going to meet them like once or twice at the beginning, or could it be multiple times, depending on the complexity it, and size of the business? It definitely depends on the complexity of the business. Some businesses are, I just did a valuation for uh, a real estate company. Right? Okay. So the, the woman was looking to retire, she had somebody that was interested in buying it, there's not much there other than the value of uh, the name and the number of people she has working under her. Okay. So it's a ma- that was a, a one in in person meeting and four or five phone calls and then a lot of time with me in the background. Okay. But that's what I wanted room. to talk about. So let's say you you meet with the owner and the principals, uh, ask them about their future plans. You know what what documents they have, business plans they might have. Um, you know, see maybe their business site. You you do that. Then you go and then you're going to work on this project. And I know you have some really great resources that help you. Yeah, there's I use software out there that really helps the valuation process because anytime you look at any particular business, there's, uh, we'll use my business as an example. I'm a CPA. So if I just started my practice last year, what I'm going to look at is what do I expect to happen in the future? Okay. Not what I'm doing right now. If I'm, um, use the woman I, I just told you about who's a realtor, she uh, bought a practice last year, a year before she bought the, or sold it. Okay. So at the end of the day, when I looked at her prior three years revenue, which is usually the starting point, the last couple of years don't really matter because... They're not reflective. They're not reflective of where she is in the current situation and where she expects to be in the okay. future. So you you have a you do the three different valuations like I said asset base, current revenues and future revenues and then based on your knowledge of the business you add different weightings both within the individual uh, calculations and in collective. Okay. So with the the um the real estate business and obviously you're not going to give out any privileged information but um did you know or get exposed to any particulars about that industry? Um, Because I mentioned at the beginning, like in my industry, I I know there's some metrics that are often used to value uh, financial planning practices. Does does the real estate industry have anything that's unique to it in terms of metrics that you got exposed to or knew about even maybe before doing this project? Yeah, I mean, at at the end of the day, but it's very similar to most other businesses. It's it's the competition competition in the area it's the uh uh, the the goodwill in the name that you have right you have a good name i have a good name this person has a really good name in her town so there's a value to that and it's not her name in the practice it's the name of the agency that she owned right okay so all that comes into play when you're sitting down and and adding adding things up and and coming up with a number and so other factors could be things like uh, a multiple of sales? Yeah, so uh, back to your question. So there's a number of, just like the a CPA has the IRS code to follow, sure. there is n- a number of um, uh, uh, references out there that give you the, mm. the proper factors, Okay. look at the, uh, the regionalization of a business, and you take all that into account when you're looking at the valuation as well. So it's not just the numbers, but there's enough information out there because what has happened is a lot of businesses have compiled the sales of like businesses so it's no different than using using continue with the real estate example when you sell a house you look at like sales in the area sure so there's companies out there that have compiled like sales for industries that okay. you use as a as mm. a Part of your valuation. Now, well. do all CPAs have access to these resources that that um, you've told me about? Bef- you know, just in our normal course of business dealings, um, or because you do valuations and have a specialty, if you will, there that that you um, have access to these resources, or like are they free? Could somebody just Google this kind of stuff? No, right? No, I mean, a CPA can gain access to it, but sure. most of them don't. don't. 
I choose to do it. I really enjoy it. It's a different type of business and it's fun for me, right? Some people <laughs> think I'm nuts, but that's all right. So there are resources available, but it's not really available like if I wanted to Google the IRS code. Okay. Right? So I have to pay mm-hmm. for the resources that I use right. to help. All right. And it seems to me, based on my 27 years of experience, that, and I've worked with a lot of small business owners and entrepreneurs over the years, is that they have trouble assigning a value to their business for a few reasons. Number one, it's very personal to them. Mm-hmm. So that often leads to them overvaluing Correct. the business. Yeah. Um, so how do you contend with that? Because for a small business owner, they often have a lot of their self-worth and, and pride and, and they created maybe something from nothing or maybe it's a second generation business. And so there's a lot wrapped up in the valuation that goes beyond the numbers how do you how do you explain to them that the value that they may have is not legitimate in the marketplace without offending that personal it's value? A, it's a really fine line. <laughs> uh, but to the part of the discussion we, we had a few minutes ago is there's enough metrics out there that I could show and say based off your current revenue model or current uh, situation – these are the things that we have to file within reason, sure. right? So remember, the metrics are something to use as a guideline. They're mm-hmm. not the steadfast rule. So say that real estate agent is the only person in Southington where you're based. That's going to be the value of that business is going to be considerably greater sure. than the guy who's the next town over who's mm-hmm. got five five competitors, mm-hmm. right? So generally, what happens is you have to bring them bring them in off the ledge and say right. Let's be, you know, let's look at this with the with the fine tooth comb, mm-hmm. and let's talk like about unemotionally where look at the numbers, yeah, kind of thing. and and think about what really makes sense. Because just like again, using a real estate example, if you put a house on the market for a half million dollars, that's worth one hundred fifty thousand dollars. How many people are going to want to buy it? None. None. Yeah. Right. So you have to put a value on it that makes sense, and that's where the science comes in because. As my professor in grad school, I took a couple classes in this, and he said, listen, there's no definite right answer, but there's answers that are more right than others. Okay. That's a good way to look at it. I think the other reason why lots of small business owners have trouble valuing it is also because they built the business without the idea of selling it or having to assign a value um, it might have been a, a passion of theirs or they wanted to be self-employed, pursue the American dream that way. Um, so they never really just thought about it. So they don't really have too much of a frame of reference. Um, that conversation has to be a little bit different, although I imagine it's just an educational conversation of... Well, actually, you'd be surprised. The, the, the clients that I meet that are at the point where they're thinking about a business valuation... I've actually probably put more time and effort into thinking okay. what the number is than, than you would imagine. It may be way off base <laughs> like we've been talking about, but at the end of the day, they have a good idea of what their business is about and you know whether or not there's available uh, other businesses mm-hmm. that are similar to theirs in the general area. And the general area could be city, county, state, or the country for mm-hmm. that matter, depending on what it is. And uh, that's where it, it gets... To your point, you got to be really cognizant of who the client is and what they're doing and where they're going. So for people that are listening, especially small business owners, they may not have done evaluation. Uh, but let's just talk about some examples of when evaluation is needed. So we've kind of referred to if there's some type of transaction where you're selling the business or passing on the business to somebody else, um, clearly evaluation is often needed to figure out the value so then you could figure price and terms and all of that stuff, right? Yeah, there's a million different reasons that one could be needed. A divorce, uh, somebody passed away so the estate needs a value, uh, somebody's looking strictly to sell, somebody's looking to retire. Uh, if you're going to install an, like an ESOP plan, you need mm-hmm. a valuation to determine what, what is the price per share. Okay, so an ESOP is an employee stock ownership program. So it's basically the employees own the firm. Correct. Okay. And so you mentioned um, in the event of death, 
I'm going through this now. I have a, a client in Nevada who unfortunately passed away, had a business, and as part of the estate, the probate process, um, they had to hire somebody to do evaluation for probate and the state. They really don't have a choice. It needs to be done. Right. Um, and quite what, and many times for the reason for that is if you and I were partners and I passed away and I, my wife or spouse or what, what have you, or a uh, significant other, had the right of first refusal, but you wanted to buy that person out, you would sure. need evaluation to figure out what that value okay. is. And how often is it... Um, where the seller comes to someone and said, not the seller, I said that wrong. Let me start over. So where a buyer says, look, I'm thinking about buying this business, but I'm not sure what it's worth. Um, they could authorize or pay for an appraisal. Of course, the business owner has to agree, mm -hmm. uh, but they could initiate that process too. Is that commonplace or not so much? Not as common, but it has happened. I've done that quite a few times where a buyer has said, uh, I want to buy it, but what if the, the, the buyer and the seller were good friends and they wanted to come to a number that made sense? So you bring in essentially a third arbiter that looks at the numbers and says, here's a fair price. And then the two of them would get together and agree uh -huh. on, on that number or something similar. Okay. So in a buy-sell kind of situation, mm -hmm. you're going to need an appraisal. In the event of uh, a divorce or death, often going to need an appraisal. Does that about cover it? Yeah. There, I mean, there's other reasons, but those are the main ones. Okay. Yeah. And so with, um, you know, we've talked about this, this real estate one because it's the latest one you've worked on. So what will the turnaround be? So from the time that um, you met with, I think you said it was her, when you met with her to when she'll get uh, the uh, full the report. completed full report, how, how long do you think that'll take? I, I, I'm just curious about the timeline. Depending on how quickly you get the information to me, sure. once we, we've met and we've determined what, what direction we're going, mm -hmm. it could be anywhere from a, a couple of days to a few weeks because mm -hmm. it really depends on the complexity of, sure. of it. Right, and whether or not we have to go back, maybe sometime. I have done a couple of valuations where there was equipment that we didn't know what the value was any longer, so we had to get an appraisal of that mm -hmm. in order to include that within the uh, business valuation. Okay, and then just going back to the previous question, uh, the the one that we had worked on, we met with a client and friend of mine, Jeff, and I like what Jeff was doing because he has this plan of selling his business. I forget what it was, five or seven years kind of down the line. So he wanted to have a valuation now so that he could begin to track the work that he's doing to get the business ready to be sold, to make it marketable and to enrich the value of the business. That seems kind of unusual and very um, proactive. Extremely. At the end of the day, what he's looking to do, part of that was, if you recall, he wanted to know what it was worth today so he could work a little harder over the next five to seven years to grow the business even Correct. further Correct. to make that number and, larger. And he wanted to know the different formulas right. so that he could make sure that his business plan incorporated that so he could make his business as attractive as possible down the Correct. line by kind of working from where he wants to be backwards and figuring out all the things he needs to do to improve the business, what metrics are important. Right. Um, that seems really, really smart, but like you said, it's it's brilliant, really. I mean, because for the the return on his investment for mm -hmm. what it takes to 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 purchase and a business valuation, if he does it right over the next five or seven years, his ROI is going to be yes. You know, so huge. hopefully, Jeff is listening because <laughs> Dave literally just said he's brilliant. <laughs> so uh, you're welcome, Jeff. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else you want to add to business valuations? I think we've we've hit it all. I mean, at the end of the day, I, I think in our society where baby boomers are beginning to unfortunately pass away, retire, and think about the, the next stage of their life, I think this is something that's going to become bigger and bigger as we go forward in the next five or ten years as uh, the businesses that have grown in our generation are passed on to whomever is next in line, whether it's a family member uh, a, a co-worker, a, a partner, or or what have you. Beautiful. All right. So for um, listeners that might want to get in touch with you, um, your website is? Uh, LakeFSLLC.com. 
And if you go to the Elliott Wealth Management website, you'll get information about Dave and the work that we do jointly on the financial planning and investment planning side of things. And while you're at the site, the Elliott Wealth website, uh, please subscribe to this podcast. I'd really appreciate that. And if you're not a client of ours already, you could sign up for a complimentary consultation where we could discuss your goals your objectives, how we could help you win with money, and if appropriate, we could talk about the value of your business, and we could get that done for you too. So thanks so much, Dave. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it as well. Awesome. The views expressed are not necessarily the opinion of Sage Point Financial Incorporated and should not be construed directly or indirectly as an offer to buy or sell any securities mentioned herein. Investing is subject to risks, including loss of principal invested. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. No strategy can assure a profit nor protect against loss. Please note that individual situations can vary. Therefore, the information should be relied upon when coordinated with individual professional advice. Please note the information being provided is strictly as a courtesy. When you link to any of the websites provided here, you are leaving this website. We make no representation as to the completeness or accuracy of the information provided at these websites, nor is the company liable for any direct or indirect technical or system issues or any consequences arising out of your access to your use of third-party technologies, websites, information, and programs made available through this website. When you access one of these websites, you are leaving our website and assume total responsibility and risk for your use of the websites you are linking to. Securities and advisory services are offered through Sage Point Financial Incorporated, member FINRA SIPC, insurance services offered through Elliott Wealth Management, LLC, not affiliated with Sage Simply Point Financial. Simply Financial is part of the Exvadio Podcast Network. You can find Exvadio Podcasts at exvadio.com slash podcast the Apple Podcasts app, iTunes Store, iHeartRadio app, Spotify, Stitcher, and wherever you find podcasts. So join us and stay informed and entertained.